All right, welcome back everybody. Um, really enjoyed the morning session, the first part of the session, lots of dialogue. And I promise that this is not gonna leave any less dialogue than the prior one. So really excited uh, to have our next talk addressing depression in patients with HIV. Um, Introducing Dr. Francine Cordinals. I hope I said your name correctly. Yes. Professor of clinical psychiatry. I did clinical psychiatry and epidemiology at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University, PI at the Northeast Caribbean AIDS Education Training Center. Dr. Cordinals is really honored, has worked at the interface of HIV and mental illness since 83, both domestically and internationally. I could not read her entire bio. She's a prolific clinician, researcher, educator, and advocate. She's published more than 140 articles and book chapters, the majority focus on HIV and mental health, and has given more than 1,000 local, national, and international talks. It is our honor and pleasure to have you with us today. Take it away. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's a wonderful group to be a part of today. Um, I don't have any relevant financial relationships, never have, and sadly probably never will. And my learning objectives are to describe the approach to the differential diagnosis and management of depressive illnesses among people with HIV, to differentiate the diagnosis and treatment of major depression from the diagnosis and treatment of bipolar depression, and to cite the current evidence for the impact of depression treatment on both mental health outcomes and HIV outcomes among people with HIV. I just wanna mention, I'm not going to try to get into the little details. I'm really going to try to present a global picture. In my workshop, if you're a member of that, I will go into some of the details of different medicines and drug interactions and everything like that. So if you look at rates of depression among people with HIV, you get very different estimates depending on the world, where in the world you're doing it and who you are trying to examine what approach you're using to making the diagnosis. So it varies from six to 67%, but I think generally speaking, most people think that in a typical HIV clinical setting in the US, we have rates of depression that hover around 30, 40% for lifetime depression. Um, and that um, in the US, again, because this is not true everywhere, our depressive disorders have very high rates of comorbidity with other psychiatric illnesses, such as alcohol and substance use disorders, anxiety disorders, and PTSD. And we heard that yesterday from Dr. Green. It's not all about depression, but there's a tremendous amount of comorbidity. Now, the, here's the discouraging news I'm going to start with. Treating depressive illness isn't really easy. It involves a lot of trial and error because we just don't have any biological tests to define who's depressed um, or what treatment they're going to respond to or whether they're going to have side effects. At best, we can uh, do some studies of liver metabolism to figure out whether people have a high level or low level of certain enzymes. But that doesn't, that only helps just a little bit. Um, the idea that it is simple to screen for and treat depression is not yet true. Um, I, the brain is the body's most unique organ. I don't know if this is true because I don't know the liver as well as the brain, but probably one healthy liver is more similar to another healthy liver than one healthy brain is to another healthy brain. We all have different minds and we're wired differently. So it makes it very challenging to treat depression. Given that it's so, I've given this talk and people say to me, well, why should I even try to treat it if you're gonna tell me the things I'm about to tell you? <laughs> and I think the main reason to treat depression is not because it improves HIV outcomes. The main reason to treat depression is that it, it is one of the most frightening and disabling of all illnesses in the world. Uh, I'm gonna give you a few quotes. So this one from, was in Dante's The Divine Comedy and The Inferno. And he said of his journey, I did not die, and yet I lost life's breath. Imagine for yourself what I became, deprived at once of both my life and death. So Dante was born in 1265, and that was long before the birth of the DSM, so he had no official diagnoses. But if you read the Inferno, you'll be pretty convinced he was having an episode of severe major depression. If we look at more contemporary accounts, this is Andrew Solomon, this 
is from an article in the New Yorker, but he wrote a novel called The Noonday Demon as well. And here he's, here's how he describes his episode. I lay down fully dressed in nice clothes in the mud, and I didn't care about standing up ever again. But you don't need to ask famous people. Some of you in this audience will have had depression, and you'll know this personally, but I just have a quote from my next door neighbor who once said to me, of all the illnesses I've ever had, including my surgery for cancer, none have been as painful or frightening as depression. The reason to treat depression especially when it's severe, is that it gives people their lives back. People with severe depression that is, has, that is uh, chronic and unremitting are not fully alive. Now, how do we know the difference between depressive symptoms and depressive illness? Because we don't want to go underboard or overboard in treating depression. So we know mild depressive symptoms are ubiquitous and they can occur part, as part of almost anything, any medical illness, any neurological condition or any other psychiatric diagnosis. So it becomes very important to figure out who has depressive illness um, versus who has depressive symptoms. And this has been especially true during COVID-19 where the rates of depressive symptoms are extremely high in the general population and among ourselves as healthcare providers. Um, often we use an approach that is a, um, a little bit naive because we screen people uh, for depression and then we react to positive screens and start to treat depression. Um, but really that is not sufficient to make a diagnosis of depression. A screen tells you the probability of depression. It doesn't tell you if a person truly has a depressive disorder. So I like to think about how we distinguish between mental distress and mental disorders. As I said, very important in COVID. Usually when we're, mental distress can be caused by anything um, as we know, but mental disorders usually cause either persistent or severe subjective distress and or functional impairment. And they recognize, they meet recognized diagnostic criteria in the international classification of diseases or in the US we tend to use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And it's really clinical disease that calls for evidence-informed interventions such as medication and psychotherapy. The most commonly used uh, questionnaires are the PHQ-2 and the PHQ-9. Um, they're free of charge, they're easy to use, and you can find them on, at, the, uh, HIV, at the National HIV Curriculum. So I have that link in here. You can find out a lot about these questionnaires, including their sensitivity and specificity. I will say this, that many people use them as, and ask patients with absolutely no interest in how patients answer, answer these questions. And you're not likely to get honest answers when you do that. So for example, I was once having a colonoscopy and the person who was checking me in was staring at a screen. She read me all the, page, the questions on the PHQ-9. And I thought to myself, if I had any of these symptoms, I would never be telling you. So that's the other problem with these screens. When they're done routinely by people who have zero interest in what the patient is saying, uh, you'll often get no answer. It's important to know that there are two types of depressive illness. Um, one are depressive disorders themselves, and the most prominent is major depression, and that's where the most studies are. But there's also persistent depressive disorder, which includes what was previously called dysthymia. So now persistent depressive disorder can just be major depression that doesn't go away, because typical episodes of major depression last six to eight months, or a level of symptoms that's very persistent and uh, causes a lot of distress or impairment. But the other important form of depression is bipolar depression. So bipolar disorders have a depressive phase uh, and uh, bipolar one is defined by mania being present, bipolar two by hypomania being present and cyclothymia uh, by milder symptoms than that. And, um, and, people, and, and, and people who have bipolar depression uh, need a different treatment than people with uh, depressive disorders, and I will get to that. 
I th think of a major depression as a comorbidity of HIV infection. I think of it as a medical comorbidity because in addition to all the affective symptoms you see in depression, you have somatic symptoms, which are quite pronounced, which I've listed here on this slide. Another thing that suggests that it's really a medical illness is that major depression among people with HIV, and for that matter, any other medical illness is associated with increased mortality. Um, so something that kills you probably also has a medical component um, and it's associated with worse outcomes in the case of, of HIV along the entire HIV care continuum. But as I was saying, we don't have any penicillin for depression. And I wanna introduce the, the um, endpoints we look for when we treat depression, uh, which I'll discuss more in my workshop. One endpoint is what we call response to treatment. That means that more than 50% reduction in symptoms has occurred. That is a much less desirable outcome than remission uh, from depression, where there are few or no symptoms because persistent symptoms uh, are very debilitating and they pose a risk for relapse. Now, here's the very sad evidence. Our best evidence suggests that the first time you'll try an antidepressant on a, on a patient will give you a one in three chance of achieving acute remission. That is to say, where the patient really gets better. That's so much worse than the outcomes we get with HIV that I know that sounds discouraging. The two points I wanna make is that it's very important to switch. So usually we keep somebody on a medicine for six to eight weeks, the first antidepressant to see if it works. Um, if it doesn't work after that, um, and we haven't had to stop because of toxicity, we can switch to a second antidepressant. It's important to go up to the maximum dose before giving up on, on a trial. Um, but the second antidepressant trial has almost the same chance as the first of achieving remission. So you want to know that it's worth switching after you give a trial six to eight weeks at an adequate dose to something else. And it almost doesn't matter what the something else is. And because we have a third of a chance the first time around and a third of the chance the second time around, two out of three patients, if we give them two trials, um, will achieve acute remission. And, um, my, and then th that's my point that it's very important to know that how to use more than one antidepressant and to be able to switch. I'm not going to cover psychotherapy because I don't think that's who most of the audience is, people doing psychotherapy. Um, but I will say that after two adequate trials of antidepressants, you really wanna refer to mental health specialty care if you possibly can, because you start to see worse results with subsequent trials. And you might also wanna refer for some of the more complicated depressive conditions, including bipolar depression, psychotic depression, people who are at risk for suicide, people where you're just not sure what's wrong, and people who need some of our specialized treatments in depression like brain stimulation or experimental treatments like ketamine, and those I will discuss in the workshop. Bipolar depression accounts for the time that most people with bipolar disorder spend unwell. And that probably explains why over three in 20 patients who are diagnosed with depressive disorder in primary care actually have an unrecognized bipolar disorder. That is a huge issue because the first line pharmacologic treatment of bipolar depression is mood stabilizers lithium anticonvulsants, atypical antipsychotics. Whereas for major depression, it's antidepressants. When you give antidepressants to people who have bipolar depression, it's going to work very poorly to improve the depression and it may precipitate mania, causing you a much bigger um, management problem than when you, when you had a patient who was merely depressed. How do you know someone has bipolar depression? Well, there are no brief screens. Um, I've listed one tool that's available, again, in the National HIV Curriculum, the Mood Disorders Questionnaire. It's always worth asking if a patient has ever been told they had mania or if they have relatives with mania. The questions I find is, if you're gonna just ask a few questions is, has there ever been a time when you weren't your usual self and you had much more energy? 
Has there ever been a period of time when you needed much less sleep and you didn't miss your sleep? You know that most, most people would never say that. Uh, it's also interesting to ask about racing thoughts. Those are some of the things that clue you to the possibility of bipolar depression. <clears throat> On average, bipolar disorders are more severe illnesses than depressive disorders. They, have a, uh, they need more attention. They have a more difficult course. And it's one of the reasons why in the latest DSM, the DSM-5, we separated out depressive disorders from bipolar disorders. We stopped lumping them as affective disorders. However, I want to say that bipolar dis disorders are associated with an incredible level of um, creativity. And unfortunately, a lot of trouble treating because when people are euphoric and are in, in a hypomanic or manic state, they'll often reject care. They're much more likely to enter care in a depressed state. So I'm just showing you some bipolar people just to, you know, it's my little anti-stigma campaign. Uh, you'll see Ed Edvard Munch's famous picture. You'll see, that's a self-portrait by Vincent van Gogh. I love the fact that Winston Churchill not only got uh, England through World War II, but re received uh, a Nobel Prize in literature. Um, when, when people are able to work with bipolar disorder, not everybody can do this, um, they, are, they can be very fast. Um, he wrote more than anybody who operates at normal human speed could ever hope to write. It's important, therefore, I think, not to just stigmatize these disorders, but to understand that these are also in many ways special people. Getting closer to AIDS, there was Alvin Ailey, a renowned modern dancer and choreographer. Uh, he died of AIDS in 1989 before there was effective treatment and his bipolar disorder was very much aggravated by drinking and drug use. Drinking and drug use is a huge issue for psychiatric disorders and for depressive disorders. We can't really explain why we have so much comorbidity, but I would say that we don't understand the biological causes of these disorders. So it's not surprising that we can't understand why we see so much comorbidity. It, there may be um, many underlying biological and genetic factors uh, that lead to the phenotypes we see. Um, that have some fairly common underlying etiologies. What is very clear is that we have a siloed system of care and often mental health treatment is separated from substance use treatment, even though substance use disorders are mental illnesses. And siloed treatment is a major barrier to good behavioral health care. Also stigma is a major barrier um, to uh, good uh, health care. And that's why um, we see that a large number of people with alcohol and substance use disorders receive no treatment for these conditions. So um, in general, this doesn't relate specifically with HIV, I should tell you that there are very few studies in people with HIV the, about how to use psychotropic medication. Almost all of the knowledge I use when I do it comes from the general psychiatric literature. This is an extremely poorly studied area um, within HIV care. Um, but we do know looking at the general literature uh, that people who have two diagnoses, a major depressive disorder and an alcohol and substance use disorder um, tend to have a much worse outcome than people who, don't, who only have one of these disorders. And in looking again, this is not people with HIV, but in general, if you look at people with bipolar disorders, they have a 42% prevalence of alcohol use disorders, a 20% prevalence of cannabis, and a 70% prevalence of other illicit drug use disorders. So in the US, these, we see a lot of this. And the most important point, and it took me a long time to learn this even myself, is that two disorders need two separate treatments. Um, that you can't treat substance use and alcohol misuse and hope that depression goes away. Nor can you treat depression and hope that substance use will go away. These two disorders need two separate treatments. I like to talk about the World Health Organization Pyramid of Mental Health Services. 
I've used that in my international work, but under COVID, I've used it in the US. When you do work internationally, there aren't a lot of behavioral health providers. So you're trying to think about how people can get good care without a lot of specialty referrals. Now I can tell you there are many parts of the US that have the exact same problem. So it's not just something we see in international settings. So that's why the World Health Organization tried to help people understand that keeping people well in terms of mental health involves every possible level of care. It involves self-care where we teach self-management to patients. Nobody with bipolar disorder is ever going to manage that illness without self-care. It involves informal community care where we think about all the social determinants of health. So we know if somebody doesn't have a place to live, they're gonna do worse with a mental health problem if they're starving, you know? So we think about what's available in the community to address the social determinants. We rely on primary care to do the initial screening for depression because most people will initially make a medical visit to primary care and not to a psychiatric setting. So at the very least, we strongly rely on primary care to detect depression and bipolar depression and um, to be able to, even if they need to refer up the, the pyramid for treatment, to be able to manage patients who are stable. There are not enough psychiatrists and, and a nurse, mental health nurse practitioners to follow every stable patient. It's really important um, to do that in primary care. And there are many models of collaborative care um, that help people figure out how to do that. Although often people with the most severe mental illnesses like psychotic disorders have a lot more trouble getting their needs met uh, in, in, you know, in terms of their severe psychiatric illness and their severe uh, medical conditions. Um, so this is what I just said to you. I wanted to um, make a point about, and I don't know if I put this in a slide. Yes, okay. This is where it is. So what do we hope for when we treat people uh, with, for depressive illness? Again, as I said in the beginning, where we really hope for relief of suffering and improved quality of life. Um, we hope to reduce disability and cognitive dysfunction. And here I can make a few points to things that have been presented earlier in this conference. Major depression causes severe cognitive dysfunction. You see it in young people and you see it in old people. So when you look at people with cognitive dysfunction, you really want to figure out if they're also depressed. Um, in younger people with cognitive dysfunction, often treating depression will vastly improve cognitive function. In older people, it tends to get more complicated because they could have cognitive problems and depression. It, and I and not only that, depression has to be distinguished from the kind of uh, a flat affect you often see, the flat emotion of people who who have dementia. So I'm really talking about real depressive symptoms. It's very important to treat depression um, if you have somebody with cognitive impairment who's also depressed. You may really get some advantage to doing that. Um, you're trying to increase people's ability to function. Depression is considered a lot more disabling than AIDS uh, by the World Health Organization in, in terms of the disability it causes. And we wanna reduce mortality due to suicide or medical illness. And on that, on that score, I wanna make a couple of points that refer to other presentations that have occurred at this meeting. As a person who's 76 years old, I am personally offended by mortality not being one of the M's in how to take care of the elderly. I, I would never go to a, a, a doctor myself who didn't care how much longer I was going to live. In my view, it's a form of ageism not to be concerned with the mortality in the elderly. I'm working full time. I have a lot of goals in my life. I like to go to a clinician who wants to keep me alive. Um, I also think that we're not following mortality in HIV care. It's not on the HIV care co continuum, and this is an enormous disservice to our patients. By not following mortality, we're missing out on health inequities, just as Tim Wilkins said today about cancer. There are health inequities and in who gets good care. You'll see them if you follow mortality. Um, mental illnesses and, su and substance use disorders greatly shorten lifespan. 
If we're not following mortality, we're not picking up on that. You can look at outcomes of people with HIV with mental illness and see just how much more elevated their mortality is. That's what we need to get to, not just improve rates of viral suppression and reduce HIV morbidity and mortality where the data we have is a little bit confusing as to whether it helps or not with those outcomes. When we do use um, medications in people with HIV in general, we get the same kind of results in people without HIV. We're, we're, it, it's, it's very helpful to use the usual medications. Um, the, we do want to um, you know, look at interactions and overlapping toxicities, uh, which I'm going to go into in, um, in my workshop because I just didn't have time to cover it here. But we both worry about interactions and toxicities, and especially we don't want to lower antiretroviral levels. So I will devote my workshop to discussing those questions. And I'm going to stop exactly one second on time. Awesome. That was fantastic. Um, so first, I mean, I, I'll take the first question. I can't, I have to ask for your anti-aging serum, a mouth drop when you said you were 76. So amazing. Um, there are a ton of <laughs> there are a ton of questions. The chat is live, um, so let me maybe try to put these in some order. I think first, uh, the, when there are several questions about what constitutes a an appropriate trial for an antidepressant before you move to another. And I thought I heard you say, it, but maybe it, give what constitutes uh, an adequate trial is really going to the full dose. Uh, it's, it can be a big mistake in, in people who are not psychiatrists or behavioral health specialists to not realize that going to the full dose is needed. You have to know that there are people who do specialized psychopharmacology. I'm not one of them. And they will exceed the recommended doses. Um, and sometimes you need to do that. You can look at cytochrome P450 enzymes to figure out if you have somebody who's a very rapid metabolizer because that can lower blood levels. You can try doing blood levels. People don't usually do those things. Um, also, it takes a while for antidepressants to work. So you really need to go a full six to eight weeks. The reason not to stay on an antidepressant trial for six to eight weeks is toxicity. If someone can't tolerate the antidepressant, you're gonna stop it much sooner. But if the person's tolerating it and you have time, um, you know, and uh, you can wait the full six to eight weeks. The other thing I have to say is that as with all things about the elderly, start low, go slow is the rule. Uh, so when people get older, you know, we want to start with lower doses and make our way up. But that doesn't mean we, want, we don't want to get to the maximum dose if we need it. Question. You know, I, in terms of the low and slow, and you know, one of the th things I often find really challenging is, is patients, they want a magic fix, and, and trying to wait that time to get to max dose oftentimes can be, be challenging for them. When they it is be very it. hard to treat this illness. I always tell my patients there's a good chance they'll feel better before they feel, I mean, there's a good chance they'll feel worse before they feel better. That the antidepressant side effects are going to kick in for the antidepressant therapeutic effects. There is a subgroup of people who start to feel better right away, let's say on an SSRI antidepressant, but they are a minority. Most people are gonna to have to suffer through side effects before they start to feel better. Um, maybe starting to feel a little better for a lot of people beginning at around two weeks, um, but the full effect not occurring for six to eight weeks. So, you know, it requires a lot of handholding. Now, in psychiatry, um, when I start someone on an antidepressant medication or any medication, I let them know, and this is hard to do in primary care, I let them know to contact me if they're having any okay. frightening problem. Because there's nothing as scary as suddenly developing some you know, side effect from a psychotropic medicine and you know, being terrified by it and not having a next appointment for a week. So I think that's the other thing that makes this practice hard. You really yeah. need to have an open, people have open access to you if they're having trouble with their medication. There's several questions about sort of how you sequence things. What do you try first? What do you try second? I don't know if you want to take a general sort of 
Do you now or you want to wait till your workshop? And of course, no, I can do it now. Okay. <clears throat> For mild depression, people like to start with cognitive behavioral therapy and other forms of psychotherapy. There are many patients who will improve just by talking. And although there are certain evidence-based therapies that do better than non-evidence-based therapies, even not doing a non, you know, an evidence-based therapy, sometimes you're talking some, somebody through a problem, a social situation, uh, you know, a, a, a life crisis that if you talk them through it, they're gonna start to feel better. So I always like to start if somebody is mildly depressed or sometimes even moderately depressed with just talking. Also, I, can, I try to get buy-in when I'm talking. But, hey, if this doesn't work, I want to use a medicine because there's more reluctance on the part of people to take medicine there, than there is to talk, at least once you're engaged with them. So um, yeah, so I, I like psychotherapies. I think psychotherapies are also a good adjunct. For the most severe forms of depression, we tend to use uh, medications. Uh, you know, a lot of people with severe depression can't really concentrate very well. And they're not great participants in psychotherapy because their mind is somewhere else anyway. Um, so we like to use somatic treatments with severe depression. This one is a, a hot button one, so I'll ask this one. Could you comment about the use of marijuana for depression? Um, you know, many patients stating that the marijuana makes them feel better about themselves. I and mean, it's, it's, if I had a dollar for every marijuana card request, I'd be rich. So if you can comment on that. For the most part, marijuana is not a therapeutic treatment for any psychiatric disorder. As a drug of abuse, it may be just fine. I'm not commenting on that. There are lots of people with lots of ideas about how marijuana helps them. But if you look at what evidence we have, marijuana does not help people. Um, and, you know, and I'm not talking about CBD, which doesn't have a psychoactive component. The psychoactive component of marijuana in psychotic illness is associated with worse psychosis. There's really no evidence that it's a treatment for depression. I, uh, um, marijuana is not, it's not a treatment that, that we use in psychiatry, but lots of our patients use it. And I'm not saying there aren't people who advocate. I'm not saying there aren't people who say that marijuana is great. I just don't, I myself personally haven't seen evidence that convinces me. Gotcha. Um, I was struck by your own experience about the PHQ-9 when you were taking, getting your colonoscopy. So I, I, there are several questions about, well, what do you recommend for screening? How would you recommend? Is it a tablet where a patient fills out? And who, who should do that? So I wonder if you can comment how, if, on screening that's done well. Well, you know what, in, in some ways, you know, we tend to ask sensitive questions on, a, on tablets. We know, for example, in HIV, that people give more honest responses to their sexual behavior on a tablet. So probably the patient filling out a form on a tablet they get, is going to be a lot more honest. Um, the, I think the worst thing is people are asking, and it's very clear they're being forced to ask because it's on a medical record and you have to, and they really could care less. Um, and believe me, patients know that you could care less. And they're not interested in talking to you when that's the case or telling you what's going on. So you have to just have the attitude that either you give it to the patient to do on their own, or you have someone do it who doesn't pr project the idea that they could care less what the patient said. Right. There, there are a couple of questions about um, genetic testing for to push deciding on which antidepressant may work best for a person. Do you have any comments about that? We don't have good genetic testing. You know, we, we do a lot of things experimentally. Um, there are a lot of research studies underway that look at genetics, um, but they really have no practical application in the clinical world other than figuring out whether people are rapid or slow metabolizers, you know, in the, in the cytochrome P450 system to try to figure out why some people have you know, you know, need much higher doses or, or some people get very severe side effects at low doses. That we have, mm -hmm. we're not yet, we're trying. We're desperately trying to get to a place where we have biological things to guide us about, you know, response and treatment. We can't even do it for diagnosis. You know, that's why we have a DSM change that changes all the time. We're like blind men feeling the elephants. We keep re-describing what we see. We're looking at the phenomenology. We don't understand the underlying etiology. You know, we have a million theories. That doesn't prove that those theories are explain the story. 
I have one last question I thought may be worthwhile, given that there's so many comorbid depression and alcoholism. It's a great question about what do you treat first when you have somebody with both of those things? If the person is using um, illicit drugs where it's unsafe to give antidepressants, I think you need to do something with the illicit drugs. But if they're taking something where it's not gonna cause an interaction, I would go ahead and just treat the, anti, the, the depression at the same time as I'm treating the substance use disorder. Um, of course, you know, you work at, and, and, you know, to and really look at, you know, interactions between illicit drugs, recreational drugs. I didn't mention that St. John's wore terrible, terrible uh, for people with HIV on antiretrovirals at lowest antiretroviral levels. That's what we worry about the most. I tell my patients, do not take St. John's wort. And I would advise you to tell your patients the same. Um, you know, people take all kinds of herbal remedies. That's a big no-no. Awesome. Well, we are out of time. I knew it was going to be exciting, reminding people that you have a workshop later this afternoon. And for those, please do attend and give feedback. Thank you, Dr. Cornos. Okay, and drop thank your you so anti-aging serum in the chat. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>